everybody is ready to get their link building juice on. So now I know that this is going up onto YouTube, I might not necessarily share as much as I might share if it it anyway. So what the heck? Let's be crazy. So as you can see, I'm going to be talking about scaling link building or outreach efforts. But what I don't want you guys to think is that I'm going to talk about dirty black hat tactics, because while those are a great flash in the pan, they tend to actually be a flash in the pan. Now, this is who I am. You can Google me. We don't really need to run through this. It's, or use DuckDuckGo, or you can use Yandex or any search engine of your choice. Or ask a friend, turn to your neighbor, say, who's that crazy Canadian who's on my video screen right now? You know, uh, not everybody knows who I am, but hey, it'd be fun and a conversation starter. So that's me. Now, what are we going to do today? We're going to be talking about link building. Oops, that was a little bit fast. Um, but what I wanted to do is just break it down into some easily digestible bits with sexy names, because you know, I love to call something that it might not necessarily be, but sounds sexy. So we're going to be talking about broken links and broken link building. Now, I'm going to cover two sides of broken link building, the good side and the side that I really hope you guys will not do. So, you know, be be good and be honest out there. I'm going to be talking about evergreen content. And I think this is the most important part of this whole of this whole deck is uh, creating evergreen content that is going to be what uh, attracts people to your site. And I'm going to talk about several different types. I haven't got a lot of slides on this, but I'm going to give you some examples of types of content that could work. I'm also going to be talking about how methods of doing things more quickly than perhaps your clients might enable you to do. I'm also going to be talking about dead domains rising from the grave. It is about Halloween. Um, I'm also going to be talking about how you can look at other people's backlink profiles and hopefully things like the visibility of their staging website. And I've got a couple of tools I'm going to share with you. Um, one specifically, it's not a very popular tool, but it's one that I happen to use in a recent um, analysis of someone's link backlink profile. I'm also going to be talking about info infographics for front and profit. <laughs> and I'm going to be talking about building your own network. And at the very end, if I have time, because you know me, I ramble. I also swear a little bit. So I apologize right now. I'm going to try to not swear so that YouTube doesn't put the 18 plus sticker on this video and not allow people to see it who don't disclose their age. So at the end, I'll be talking about a little bit of bonus material if I have time. If I don't have time, no problem. I'm sure that there'll be other opportunities for me to share. It. So off we go, as you saw earlier, um, when I flicked through to it, broken links, bring the bacon, as in bring the money in. Um, so I don't actually know where that saying comes from. I'm quite sure it has something to do with maybe 1918 depressions or the, the war or the, the 1939 depression or something like that. I'm sure that it's got some root in history. Um, but anyway, it's fun. It's a funny saying and uh, we love it. So what do I mean by broken links? I mean, checking your own website and checking the links coming into your website and seeing those links going through all those redirects that I was doing an analysis on once that had, I think it was 474, 475, something like that, links to this one page that went through a 302 to a 301 to another 301 to a 404 because there's nothing quite like redirecting things through three hops before saying, you know what? It's gone. It's not here anymore. We've redone the website five or six times now. And yeah, that page disappeared. Anyway, good luck finding your way around our new site. So it's a really good idea, especially with a new client. If you've got a new client on board or if you're new into an organization, do a quick analysis of backlinks because that can be really, really profitable um, as far as you having found a whole bunch of links that you can repoint. Now, you might ask, you know, is it really worth the while when you have, you know, a bazillion links that you've got to actually go through and you've got to email everybody and you can't really see email addresses really easily anymore. Even Scrapebox has trouble. I would say it's worth it because you're worth it. I've done this for clients. Um, 
In fact, I did it for the last agency I worked with. Um, so that was some years ago. So they won't mind me sharing this now because they too have rebuilt their website five or six times since I left. So um, this is a little bit older. But what I did is in my downtime, so this was not a, a live active hot project. What I did is I just, if I had like five minutes, 10 minutes of downtime or whatever, I just slotted this in between client work and other stuff. And I went in and I said, you know what? I love the fact that you guys linked to us. Thank you so much for linking to us. But the page that you're linking to is this one and it's now moved over here. Would you mind updating the link? No problem. If you can't update it, website, let us know if you like it or not. And if you don't like it, let us know what you think we should change. Because what that does is it gives you a few different angles that you can pull someone in on. First of all, obviously, you're trying to get the link fixed, right? And your whole will have the content. You just want them to be point direct because some right? I know some of you are nodding out there. I can see you nodding through my webcam. You are nodding so hard in sympathy with me on this. Absolutely. Yes. You know it. You know it. So get those links repointed, especially the valuable ones. Now, generally journalists aren't going to respond to this, so don't even bother. But websites out there that gave you a link that you didn't even know gave you a link, why not email them? I've had links to the day from the Daily Mail to the wrong website. And as a result, we're actually restructuring that particular website because people keep getting it wrong. And we're like, you know what? Maybe we really should be using the .com instead of the .co.uk. But more about that later. Um, it's a really good idea to repoint the internal links. And of course, there is also the example, and I've taken this from someone else, which is published on the internet. So it's not a secret. You should be doing this, but maybe you created an awesome resource and maybe somebody else, maybe they've disappeared from the internet for some reason. You know, it happens. And maybe you've noticed because maybe you were monitoring their website and maybe you saw that the page in question went bye-bye. So if that happens, this is a very good example of what you might maybe possibly could do if that content no longer existed anywhere on that other site. Now, please be careful because I don't want you going out and checking all of your competitors backlinks and going, hey, um, I noticed that uh, you're linking to this broken asset. Uh, point to ours instead when the other website has merely moved it and that page is maybe 404 by accident. So, you know, we want to be looking at it where it doesn't actually exist anymore on the other site. And you can actually find people who are linking to that asset very easily. Ahrefs, SEMrush, Majestic. There are lots of tools out there that will show you from a third party point of view who is linking to that page. Now, I use this for other reasons, like, you know, somebody built an awesome asset and we just happen to have the same asset. But you know what? We didn't shout about it enough. And so it went unloved. And I'm sure many of you have unloved assets. So another reason I might do this is to find out who's linking to that other person who's really aggressively going after its asset and say, hey, you kind of look like you might be a good prospect. Any chance for cheeky, as we say in the UK, but it's worthwhile because sometimes you make something and it just languishes for years. Somebody else comes along, steals the idea and they do awesomely well. And you're like, you know what? I want to be part of that awesomeness because I was there first. So um, do do check, check dead links. Now, I, again, I'm saying that, you know, lots of links, lots of pages have lots of links. Some pages have zero links and still rank. Um, but we won't talk about those this time because they're a very special kind of link that they're using anyway. Um, lots of pages have lots of links. And what we want to do is we want to capitalize on that so we can use these tools to find those. But stop right there. I don't want you doing this to people, as I said, who still have that asset on their site and they've just moved it and haven't redirected it because that's wrong. 
because we're not here to steal other people's links. We're not here to trick other websites into giving them the link that is going to the other person by saying, hey, um, you've got this dead link on your site. Um, here's the asset over here. <laughs> Don't do that. That's not nice. I've had clients um, had that done to them. I, as a blogger, have had that done to me where people have said, hey, I noticed that you have a link to this really awesome asset, but oh, it's not there anymore. Hey, we have the same thing linked to us. No, sorry, sweetheart. I'm not linking to you uh, because I know what you're on about. So please don't do this to people who still have that content. Please, as per the example, only do this where the content no longer exists on that website because we're nice people, right? Right? We are. Now, the most important part of this uh, session is about evergreen content. Why? Because thrown around so much. What does it mean? It means that it, it's not news, right? It's content that you've made that is usable more than one day of the year, more than one day of this, this cycle. It's content that can be gone back to again and again and again. And some seasonal content can be evergreen in that it can work year after year after year. The um, three best evergreens to use as a Christmas tree. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but there are different kinds of pine trees. And the ultimate Christmas tree is only one or two specific types of pine tree because some pine trees have needles that are too long. Some, they, they have weak branches. They don't hold the ornaments properly. So there's only really one or two, or maybe at the outside, three types of, of um, evergreens that you want to be using as a Christmas tree. And there you go. Every year, as it gets closer to Christmas, people are going to be like, what's the best kind of tree for a Christmas tree? And boom, every year you have a traffic spike. And that's what we want to be doing. Now, lots of these assets are extremely valuable. I'm not talking about just Christmas trees because knowing the right kind of Christmas tree to get not only saves you a lot of heartache and stress and dragging a Christmas tree into your home only to find out that it's the wrong one, um, but it also can actually help people. So this is actually a, a really helpful article about um, speech and uh, language therapy and things like that and how the people use them and things like that. And they create a lot of really valuable assets. Like if I have an autistic improve their language skills and websites like this put things together like that and it lasts forever. You know, every three to six months, maybe you update it if you have people's contact details or organization come on board, you add them as old organizations go away, you take them away. And a couple of years from now, people will be emailing you and saying, hey, I noticed that your website links to this awesome asset, but they're no longer there. See, people will do it to you too if you create amazing assets, but people will be coming for that. Now, this is the key point. You want to make sure that it is somewhere in your sales cycle that you're building this content. Now, don't do what one of my clients was doing before I joined, which was the blog was just about promoting products like, you know, candles. Ah, this season, use a vanilla bean candle with hints of lime. Really? Really? That's your blog? is just why I should be using a vanilla with hints of lime this season? I don't think so. That is not great evergreen content, but it will take you some effort to make this kind of content. So you want to be thinking about what could people be linking to years from now? For instance, old books, old movies, they're going to be around for a long, long time. So why not consolidate something out of the movies? For instance, this is um, an article which includes a link to a post about the last lines of the most beautiful books ever written. Now, of course, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So maybe they picked ones that you don't agree with. There are people that spark excitement, that, that cause discussion. Oh, have you seen this article? This article says that these are the most beautiful books ever written, but they did not include my favorite book. And then you get the link. See? So controversy can inspire links. In, 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 
educational things inspire links. There's a great book called Contagious. And check out that book, either audiobook or I think it's been translated into a few different languages. Contagious. That book is an amazing distillation of everything you need to know about writing content especially evergreen content that's going to continue ranking for years and years and years from now. So get the book. Anyway, to get on with evergreen content, there's lots of evergreen content that you can create, but you really want to be creating content that if you have to refresh it, you can keep it up. So if you're making something that is a bunch of, of assets like places to get speech and language therapy for children, you want to make sure that you're able to keep that up. Or I've I've used handbags here. Uh, the top 84 best gifts for a 10-year-old boy as well. So you can see here, obviously not handbags for 10-year-old boys. That's a little later on. But you can see um, best gifts, but it's got the year. Do you see that? 2021. So this means that every year, January 1st, you have to have, or maybe not, because you can see these aren't all January 1st blog posts or writing something from scratch new, but that's not a really good use of your link building efforts. So update, don't make duplicates. Now, obviously, sometimes if you're in the fintech sector, you have to keep the old content and the new content. So obviously, this is not going to work for you. But if you're not in fintech and you don't have to keep the content, keep updating that content every year because you know it's easier than writing it from scratch. Of course it is. Now, we want to be doing something that's unique. And I've always talked about surveys. Um, I suggest using inexpensive survey products. And especially if you've got one question with multiple answers, it does take more time to craft this, but it is less expensive than doing a two or three or four question thing. So really, really think about that. Also, numbers you saw before 84 best gifts for a 10 year old boy my, my nephew's 10 this is why i'm obsessed with what the best gifts are for a 10 year old boy christmas is coming i'm going back to toronto soon and i need to have christmas gifts in my luggage what what i i barely see him i haven't seen him for two years he's like a, a, a young man now he's not a little boy what do i get for him what do you buy for a kid that age and he's not really a kid but he's not really an adult or a teenager or anything so you know, this really helps. And numbers, 84, good. However, maybe not 84 of the top designer handbags. You'll see that example later. That's that's not a good number. It's too high. That's too much choice. But if it's for a 10-year-old kid and it's toys, 84 is good. Like, the more the merrier. At 150, people start to tune out. There is a psychological limit at which point people will stop. They'll be like, uh... 250. No, that's too much. I can't do that. Oh, look, they've only got 84. I'll do that one. So more is not always better. Think about the psychology of it. If you give people too much, they'll go away because they can't deal with it. Now, research, I say it, it is expensive. But again, it's like survey work. Sometimes you can take other people's data and you can do new things with it. And that's where Google's data set research comes in. Sorry, Google's data set search. Now, I did say one question cheapy, census-wide. Now, I've put this in here because this is an amazing company. If you do the single question option with multiple possible answers, it is really inexpensive to use. And if you craft your question carefully enough and have multiple possible answers, you can actually get some really interesting data out of it. But this is the only company that I'm aware of that does something at a reasonable price for this kind of research. So you can do original research for a few hundred dollars or a couple of hundred quid. It's it's really very useful. But as I said, Google data set um, search. So you can actually search um, to usually only educational institutions are interested in this stuff because it's like the 36,000 different types of cells in the human body. I, I don't think I want to know. Um, but I've taken an example of wine because the region uh, that um, Istanbul is within has some amazing wines, just really beautiful, bold, robust wines, like reds that are gorgeous. Um, and, you know, you, you can make very low alcohol wines, you can make no alcohol wines, but 
what kind of wine research can we find? So I went in and I went in and looked at wine data sets and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And you can actually find one on the quality of wine where they've taken different wines and said, well, what is the quality of this based on chemistry? So you can actually look at quantitative research on something that is qualitative, the quality of wine. So it's amazing. Google data set search is amazing. But also, you know, our friend SEMrush. I love SEMrush. I'm always using it. I randomly tweeted the other day. I was like, I love, no one's paying me to tweet this, but I love SEMrush. Um, and I, it's like, because people assume if you say something positive about a company, you're clearly getting paid. I was not being paid. I just love SEMrush. And I love that I can use SEMrush to find questions like, how many calories are there in a glass of red wine? How many calories are there in a large glass of red wine? Would you believe there are 250 some odd milliliters in there. And that means that there are a significant number of calories. Thinking about that when you're going in there and doing things. Now, um, we also want to be thinking about what the competitors are up to. Remember I said handbags? Note, it is not 84 of the best handbags. It is 35. And I will tell you this for free, so to speak. This is a, I think it's a North American saying. Sometimes I talk Canadian. Sometimes I talk British. Um, you can see here that the 35 of the best handbags under 200 pounds, because I did this in the UK, from L. And 35 is a much more approachable number for handbags than 84. But for children's products, 84 is, a, is an approachable number. So there is some wiggle room in here. you got to be thinking about these things. They'll go into the search results and look at what other people are doing. Don't blind yourself to that and think you're doing something awesome. And then you're like, why am I not ranking? Oh, it's 60 million other people have written the same article. That's why. Um, now, Hacking Haro. I, I mentioned Hacking Haro. Now, Haro is help a reporter out. And this is where a reporter or a blogger or a journalist might go in and say, I, I need a quote on anti-disestablishmentarianism and I need it by two o'clock today. Now, this is a problem for some companies. As I said, I work in fintech uh, with fintech companies. Um, and for those fintech companies, if at nine o'clock in the morning, a journalist says, I need a quote on the approaching economic doom due to the asteroid about to hit the earth um, and runaway inflation as a result of the timeline for that asteroid hit. Um, and I need it by two o'clock today because clearly the asteroid's about so sometimes you need to do something a little bit better and you need to do something a little bit faster. Same with Twitter, journal requests, you know, journalists going in and saying hashtag journal request, I need this or in the UK, Sisian, which was um, Gorkana. So there are lots of places where you can go and see people asking questions like um, flirting and first date tips from bartenders. Now, uh, you know, bartenders work nights. If this comes in at nine o'clock in the morning and it's needed for 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, thank goodness you can do that in the UK because obviously that's 8 p.m. Um, British summertime or, or you know, um, and you could get it because the, the bartenders in your stable might be awake by then. But if it's, like I said, more difficult to get, maybe you need to do something else. So I went around and I, I looked at what other people were suggesting because I know what I would do and I know how I would approach it. But what, what do other people do? How do they approach this conundrum? Well, they actually hire experts from Upwork or similar. And you can see here from Agency Analytics, they have a, a great article on link building. And here is one of the best hacks out there and probably shouldn't be sharing it with you. But what you want to be doing is making sure that you're hiring experts in their field. You don't want somebody who says they're an expert, but then when it comes to their quote, it's useless and your company gets associated with it or worse, your client. So you want to be looking at people who actually know what they're talking about and you can incentivize them. So if they do get a link to, to what they, from the quote that they've given, you give them even more money. And uh, in the article, they do give you a cost benefit analysis on doing this kind of work with Haro and how much money um, they usually spend per acquisition. Citation out there is good as well, especially if you don't have many. Now, hashtags are great. Look at that. Somebody has actually given their email address in their Twitter in their tweet, I should say. So in that tweet for a journal request, they have publicly disclosed their email address because that's where they want the, um, the, the, the question answered. Now, on top of that, that means you've got their email address for possibly building a relationship with them. Maybe you can't do something now. Maybe you give them something, but it's not great. 
keep that relationship going. Build that relationship. You've got them on Twitter. Put them on a specific list on Twitter so that you're always looking at that list and seeing what they're doing. And you can say, hey, I noticed that you were writing about the Bahamas the other day. I've actually got a client who has a, a an island catamaran rental system. Why, why don't we work something together? We could add to your article or we could write something new or we could send you, maybe not send you out there on the catamaran for a little while. But you know, some companies do do that for journalists. So think about using Twitter to actually build relationships, not just responding to HARO requests or journal requests. So always be thinking about where the next link might come from as well. Build these relationships. And I guess dead domains is something where you've actually got links coming into a, a domain that has been alive before, but maybe has been abandoned for any number of a, uh, any number of reasons. And, and as a blogger in the food area, I can tell you, lots of bloggers go in, they tell their life stories on their blogs, in addition to a few recipes, and then they stop after a few years. And then they stop renewing the domain because it's a cost. And then I look at the content that they had on way back when give it a second life you know i'm being altruistic right <laughs> um so what can you do you can drop buy dropped domains at auction so this is godaddy and this is a place that i've been watching for for domains and i probably again should not be sharing this with you because this is now going to be a video and it's also going to be a deck and there's going to be all sorts of people who are like well i'm going to go to godaddy and bet on the domain and it's going to cost me more money but you know what in the spirit of sharing and helping you do more this is what i do um so i have gone to godaddy there are other places i might be silent about those at the moment if we were in person you could grab me during the coffee break and ask me off the record and i would share um so hopefully we'll be seeing you in person and you can ask me all your juicy gossipy questions so what tools do you really use um, I really use these tools. Um, so GoDaddy for drop domains. It's one of a number of places you can go. Please be careful with doing this. Again, do not steal competition's content. What we're looking at here is stuff that has not, um, it, that does not exist anymore. It is offline. It is off the internet. They have not rebranded and gone to a different domain. They have just simply given up the ghost and walked away from everything. Um, so you can go back into Wayback Machine. You can look at what content was there before, and there are actually tools that you can use to scrape the content out of Wayback Machine, and I have not listed them. <laughs> Just in case there's something in there that is not good. Now, I've given you a screenshot here of Kerboo. There are other tools that are available out there, um, but Kerboo is one that gives you a lovely graphical interface. I like the guys behind it. They're old ex-spammers, so they actually know spam. Um, so yeah, they're they're really good at classification. Um, and also you want to be thinking about your content uh, that you build on this new on this new previously dead domain. So like your your new zombie domain that you've brought back from the dead, you want to be thinking about also building new content that meets your business needs. We're not talking about just building a PBN here. We're talking about buying a, a drop domain, getting the content back on there because you got the links and then building as a building it as a going concern, or there are other things that you can do with it, but we're not at that section yet. So what can you also do? You can, I said, hack other backlink profile. It's all public people. There is nothing secret anymore on the internet, pretty much. You use Ahrefs, SEMrush, and Majestic together, and you've got a really good, almost comprehensive view of somebody's backlink profile. It's really hard to hide things from me or anyone on the internet. So I've just given you a SEMrush screenshot here because it was easy, um, because I use SEMrush all the time because I love it. And I, like, it sounds crazy, but I actually do enjoy using it. And I find it for as a cost for a value tool. I, I think it's really good. So um, I really like this. I really like the um, options it gives me as far as like looking at it. And I like that it does that. I It's a weird thing to say, but I love SEMrush for not deleting the spammy links. I absolutely love it. So um, it's an amazing, uh, well, it's a, it's a moderately good, um, uh, tool, but, but in addition to that tool, I also use this one. Uh, I do use other ones, but this is one that I was happy to share with everybody. Um, so Dom, I is one of the tools that I use and what that will do is it will look up and I've used, um, uh, 
earlier I showed you that really, really good example of like really valuable content that you can create with um, assets that are going to be used by people again and again and again. That was from a site called word.tips. Um, and so I've just put word.tips into here because I was already using them as an example. And you can see here that um, if we look at the IP address, and this doesn't always work because sometimes you need to be looking at other other um, footprints, but this is other things that are hosted on that IP address. So we want to be thinking about that definitely. Um, and also we want to be thinking about um, what different links might be coming in from different sites that, you know, same site, different page that different tools give us. So it's always a good thing to be looking at different links, different tools. So Dom I see here at the bottom. So always be thinking about the other tools that you could be using. Don't stick to one tool. One tool is, uh, you know, it's a recipe for failure because you'll miss so much. And I'm not saying that they're not good tools. I just mean that they see things and they see different things. So we want to be thinking about that, but we also want to then scan through those um, those email, sorry, the, the URLs for websites that we found. And then we want to email people, don't we? So we want to use a, a tool like Scrapebox or a similar tool that will go to the website and find publicly available information because, of course, we want to stay on the right side of legislation. If you're in, I think, the US, you can, you can be a little more fast and loose. But we are in the uh, EU and the UK might not be in the EU anymore, but it is still subject to some laws. Um, and we want to make sure that we aren't breaking those laws. So we're going to use a tool like Scrapebox and we're going to use it to find email addresses of the URLs that we have found by spying on the competition. And then we can use a third party software perhaps to uh, identify and find um, where they're uh, living for their email address or their contact website. And maybe we might outsource some of the initial contact. Maybe, maybe, you know, we'll get a little is to skin a cat, as they say. So there are a lot of ways to do things. Now, infographics also can work. Uh, infographics can also fail spectacularly and um, impressively. So infographics can be fun and they can work really well. This is an in, uh, interesting example of an infographic for food because when I made this slide, I was hungry and hadn't made my lunch yet. So you can see I was a little bit food obsessed. Um, but I've gone here back to the re a really impressive example from that site that w had the speech and language asset. Um, I've gone here for this one is the 100 most spoken languages in the world, which I thought was a really interesting infographic they had because it showed you in bubble sizes what the most uh, spoken languages were around the world. And it's the 100 most spoken languages and it's an infographic, but they've also got a little bit of text around it. So it's not just a picture. It's also got text. And we all know the importance of text over pictures, right? I don't have to talk about that because we all know it. Um, but infographics, they don't just stay static, that you don't just one and done. They keep gaining links over time. And if you make them an asset that can be used by other people, by journalists, by anyone, by language teachers, by anyone, you'll gain links over time by saying you can share this or you can share link back to the original source of the information. So they just passively gain links. And one of the great passive link building techniques that I've ever heard of. Stacy McNaught. Stacy McNaught has her image link building technique. And, and what is that? You may say, and why is it not in your deck? You may say, well, Stacy McNaught has an amazing way of building links through image assets. So, you know, when you go on to Unsplash or things like that, they have free to use images. Well, if you go onto Flickr, they've got Creative Commons based images. And what you can do is you can take pictures of things and you can upload them there. And with a Creative Commons license of you can use it for anything, but you have to link, give a link back to this website. Now you're seeing where I'm going with this. So you take really good pictures, get them onto Flickr or something similar with a Creative Commons attribution that is like, you can use this freely, but you need to link back to the source and boom, that is passive link building over time. Now it's not fast. It's not like going off and buying some links, but it is an amazing way to build links 
easily and quickly. And it's a way to scale it, right? The more image assets you create, the more passive link building you're doing. And it's not active link building. It's people that are finding the picture under Creative Commons licensing, and they're using it because it's relevant for them. Don't forget, you have to optimize your image first. But after that, after you optimize the image uh, file name and, and the text around it, you're done. And you're passively building links for a while. Link, building links. And you can see here that um, this particular infographic gained a lot of links over time. We also can utilize Google's image search to find places that are hosting images. So if we want places that are hosting infographics and things like that, we can actually use Google and do a reverse image search and find places that have hosted pictures in the past. See? It's an amazing opportunity to just go out there and spa not spam and uh, offer up the opportunity to link to your asset uh, because your asset's awesome. Uh, so you want to be thinking about things that you can be doing that can be passive, but there are also things that are like this that are active. But then over time, as long as it's a Creative Commons licensed infographic, we'll keep gaining, hopefully gaining links over time because you did something awesome. Um, so this is one I, I did think that you should be a little bit careful of because when, when I was looking at the backlink profile of that article, I did come across some infographic placements that were pay to play. So basically you pay them and you get your infographic place, which is a little bit like a paid link. So just be a little bit careful about that because if you're paying to place and, and you're getting a link on the back of that because you're paying to get the link, then it's a paid link. So just be aware that that can bite, come back to bite you in the end. And of course, there is always the option of building your own network. Now, this is not a simple option, okay? Because it's not just building a network and leaving it. You actually have to actively manage these sites. So you have to be need to do to keep them alive. You have to be updating them. You have to be adding content. You, you have to be getting links from places. So, you know, this is not a one and done. This is a lot of work. However, the more you build, the better it is. And you can keep adding places into your network. Give yourself links in content every once in a while. Don't just be spammy with it. Be savvy. Make it look natural and look normal. But how do you build your own network? Well, again, we're back to building um, out of dead or expired domain. So this is an example of a dead domain. Um, now, this uh, was a particularly savvily done thing, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. So you can see here that that this uh, site in question has bought this domain and the domain is dead. It's it's gone. It's no longer in existence. It was sold to the people who bought it. Um, but you can also buy dead or expired domains. Um, but you can then go in and remember earlier I said that sometimes it's not just the IP you're hosted on that is helpful. Sometimes it's your Google AdSense ID or your Google Analytics ID that can help expose your network. I, I mean, that can help show where other dropped domains might exist. So you can go in and you can use this tool to go in and find, uh, do a reverse analytics lookup and find other related websites that sale or may also have been dropped and be dead. And then with these ones and other people in the vertical that you're looking to target. So don't forget, we've bought a few domains at this point. Okay. So maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 25, maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand. It really depends on whether you're using GPT-3 uh, generated content or whether you're using um, bloggers or Upwork or Fiverr or whatever. Anyway, so you can go into the vertical and you can see where your websites don't have links that other people in your vertical do. And so you can fill in those gaps by just doing a gap analysis and making sure that you're filling in all the areas that you could possibly uh, use. And then besides your existing content that you've got on there on that drop domain that you've just populated with all sorts of content, what are you going to do in the future? So make sure that you have plans to not just update the content that's already on there, but occasionally add something new so that not just Google, but people can see that there's something going on and maybe you can use it for some affiliate income as well, not just links. You know, you can be using this to, to make some, some extra cash. It's, it's multiple bites at the Apple. So we're always thinking about where we can make our money um, and how we can recover all of those domain hosting fees and things like that. Now, there are tools that are out there 
where they will kind of mask your IP. Um, hopefully you're not going to be doing anything naughty enough to need that. Um, so please don't be doing this just to, to build something that's crappy and leave it out there to die because that actually, those links are worthless. But if you're building something that has value and adds something like the best Irish music site and you're constantly looking at new bands and things like that, and then you have a, a, a network of Irish music websites, then that's great. Um, and also you want to be looking at what your comp competitors are writing about. What, what, what content have they written about and actually ranked well for or gotten a lot of links to? So what are they doing? That might be something that you could do as well. Remember earlier when I said, you know, sometimes you write a piece of content and it's awesome, but then you're like, oh, you know, the other people got this content too. And it's awesome too, but like ours is awesomer. You should link to us. This is the kind of thing that they were doing. So always be thinking, always be thinking sneakily. And remember I said earlier that there are some interesting things that you can do with drop domains. Please don't do this and please link responsibly. But let's say you bought a drop domain and you redirected it to your main site. There's a possibility that people will continue linking to that drop domain. For some reason, even though it's a redirected domain now to the new site, maybe existed and people thought it was still live, or maybe you were masking the URL, you did an alias on your hosting instead of a redirect, and you never know why, right? We, we're, we're assuming, we're assuming you're not just being a, a spammer, we're assuming good intent. So you can buy all these drop domains, and maybe you're going to still like build links to them, perhaps. It, it's slow, but slow and steady wins the race, right? With the image link building and the help a reporter out, all of these things are scalable because you, you set the, the image stuff up and you just let it roll and give it a year and you will be doing hand over fist links. It's amazing. It really, really, really works. And also looking at competitors' backlink profiles and starting to target those, it's easy. You can outsource that. Really doesn't have to be arduous. It really does not have to be time consuming. Now, in the four minutes that I have left, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, the stuff that I've done that failed, um, that I really wasn't happy with. It didn't work. Even though it might maybe theoretically should have been successful, it wasn't. Now, there are lots of reasons why content fails, right? Um, we're not perfect. And I, I know, shocking. I know we're not perfect. What are you talking about? We are perfect. We're, none of us is perfect. We all make mistakes. And I mean, even. It's like losing packets. I don't know. I had the packet and now the packet's gone and her face is all weird. Um, but all of us make mistakes. None of us is perfect. So we, we, we do tests sometimes. Um, and sometimes we write about something and we're like, you know what? This is amazing. This is an amazing piece of content. Everybody is going to link to this piece of content. And then it goes live and you're like, why is no one linking? And you outreach to your lists and you're like, why is no one on my lists linking? And then somebody who's really nice on one of your lists emails you and says, thank you so much for sending this to me. But like Latin, its origins, impact and continued use. I don't care. No one else cares. Why did you do that? And so you suddenly realize that it's not quite what you were uh, hoping for. Sometimes your images suck. Sometimes you make images like this and the world and its dog are like, what are you talking about? Did you like what it's, you know, sometimes you get dressed in the dark and you don't look and you've got one blue sock and one black sock and you've got a blue striped shirt and black jeans on. And you look at yourself in the mirror when you go out and you're like, did I dress in the, oh yeah, I did dress in the dark. Uh, so sometimes your images suck and that's why you fail. So don't, don't, don't be so hard on yourself. Sometimes the client is like, what the, what were you thinking? I did a, a, an infographic once and I thought it was really cool. And the client was like, no, under no circumstances is that going live. I thought it was awesome. Clearly they didn't share my thoughts. But you should still persist because uh, sometimes the chickens come home to roost and sometimes they are on a lime green background with a really weird, creepy looking smile. But hey, you know what? Everybody is different. Everybody loves different things. And I know that BB will love this slide. BB is an amazing link builder and she does amazing outreach because sometimes, sometimes your outreach, your article, your infographic, whatever it's doing works. Um, however, sometimes it needs a little bit of help.
sometimes. Now, I thought I'd buy some cheap links and see what they did. Unfortunately, test. I was not trying to rank for anything. Sometimes the links didn't even register. It was up. They were going down. Uh, I did try to buy clicks. Uh, sadly, uh, although I did was careful to check and I was like, will these show up in Google Search Console? Yes, 100% will show up in Google Search Console. Um, yes, it will. I promise you it will. What do you think I found? Based on my sarcastic tone and, and attitude, I'm thinking you're probably going to know what, I, what I, I'm going to say. None of those sellers actually provided clicks. What they were doing is masking the um, URL to make it look in analytics like somebody clicked from organic. I'm sorry, that's not a click from organic. That's just bot traffic, as in BOT. So I went to this company and I said, you know, I'll give it a shot. I'll try it for some some uh, of my blog posts that are about weird recipes like, you know, chocolate Toblerone chunk cookies and things like that. Um, Irish cream cupcakes. And you know what? It did seem to work a little bit. Didn't really move the rankings much. It did seem, though, while the clicks were happening, to be making a difference. And you can see here that it does seem to be pushing some of the metrics around. An average position, you can see, starts becoming stable as a result of the clicks. You can see that while the the, the rankings didn't really go up that much, uh, um, and then there's the inverse, right? When the position actually went down, when the clicks went up. That is what's happening here. Average position is dropping like a stone where the click-through rate is going up like crazy. So it doesn't always work. This is not always successful. It doesn't always make a difference. Sometimes it makes a damage. And correlation is not causation. So it could have been any number of reasons that this happened. But don't believe everything that you read on the internet and don't believe everything that people say is works because sometimes we go in and we do these tests and checks and we're like, you know what? It's okay for a little while, but if I have to do that all the time, instead of just taking some pictures and putting them up like Stacy McNaught does and getting the links come to me and I have to keep paying these people to get the clicks to come in is not necessarily worth it. Stacy's idea is better and easier and I'm lazy and that's why I'm going to do it. So ask me anything on Twitter or, um, you know, on Facebook if you can find me, but ask me anything you want on Twitter and I am happy to help you out. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, and for anybody watching on the replay, hopefully you enjoyed it too. Judy, thank you so much. We are we really love your energy and it was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you everybody in the audience for putting up with 45 minutes of crazy. And also everybody who watched on YouTube and actually watched to this point, thank you as well. Awesome. Good job. Thank you so much to our audience too, of course.